are independent national authorities that conduct monetary policy, regulate and supervise banks and provide financial services, uh, which includes legal research. All this done with the goal to stabilize the economy, the nation's currency, keep unemployment low and prevent uh, inflation, of course. And central banks are especially important in times of crisis. That was the case in uh, during the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And it is uh, the case now during times of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are extremely honored to have three leading experts with us today who will discuss the historical development of central banking in three major Asian jurisdictions, Hong Kong, mainland China, and Singapore. Dr. Lillian Chung from the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Professor Xi Chao from CHK Law, and Professor Christian Hoffman from the NUS, the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Each of the speakers will have about 20 to 25 minutes to, for their presentation, um, leaving some room at the end for discussion. I will briefly introduce all the speakers before uh, their presentations, but before we start, I would like to remind you that, as usual, um, at our Greater China Legal History Seminars, please, uh, if you have any questions, chat them in. Um, I will collect them and then present them to the speakers um, during the Q&A session. And with this, um, please allow me to introduce the first speaker who will talk about central bank, the central, central banking history in Hong Kong, Dr. Lillian Chung. Dr. Chung JP is executive director um, of in the research department of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority as well as executive director of the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Dr. Chun is responsible for research on issues related to monetary and financial stability. Um, she has a very distinguished background, but I'd, I'd like, just like to mention that she holds a PhD in economics from the University of Wollongong, Australia. She first joined the Hong Kong Monetary Authority as manager in 1998 was promoted and was promoted to division head in 2010 in charge of research relating to macroeconomic and financial stability issues. And she was appointed to her present position in April 2015. Dr. Chan, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ding Wu, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so first of all, let me um, thank Professor C and the organizer for having me here. Um, so I will kickstart the presentation uh, today by first looking at the um, history of uh, central banking in Hong Kong. Um, um, well, as I'm an economist and not a lawyer, um, so I will talk about this topic from a more uh, economic and policy perspective rather than a legal one. Um, and I hope this perspective would be of interest to you and, um, um, and hopefully um, um, I will still be able to communicate effectively in a language that uh, some of some of you might find a little bit more technical. So, um, so with this, uh, let me share the slides um, of my presentation first. Okay. So um, I think before we go into the history of uh, central banking in Hong Kong, um, so let me first um, sort of talk a lot, little bit more about what is a central bank. Um, so what is this role and what, uh, what do they do? So I think um, you, most of you might have heard of um, the term central bank, but you might not necessarily know uh, what exactly they do. Um, so in fact, a central bank and sometimes also called reserve bank or monetary authorities is an institution that manages the currency and monetary policy of a jurisdiction and oversees its banking system. Um, so, one of the major, the most important function of the central bank, of course, is the conduct of monetary policy. And actually different central banks can have different monetary regimes and different mandates. Uh, in most major economies, the central banks set uh, their own policy interest rates uh, to control the money supply. And the mandate can, mandate can often, uh, uh, is often to maintain price stability. Um, but um, there are also some uh, 
uh, other central banks with more than one mandate, for example, in the US Federal Reserve, they have a dual mandate of uh, maintaining both price stability and maximum employment. And in the case of Hong Kong, uh, our mandate is to maintain the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate uh, stability against the US dollar through the length exchange rate system. Uh, and I will talk about it in more detail in a minute. Um, so apart from uh, the conduct of monetary policy, uh, central banks, um, one major uh, function of the central bank is also to maintain financial stability, uh, is actually acted, uh, act as a, a lender of last resort. Um, it also manages um, the foreign exchange reserves. Uh, it also manages the payment system, including the interbank clearing systems. Um, it also issues notes and coins. Um, of course, in Hong Kong, I think it's a, a rather a peculiar feature of uh, the current currency board system in Hong Kong, where um, the, the, the bank notes are actually um, issued by the three uh, commercial banks, uh, uh, the HSBC, Standard Chartered, and the Bank of uh, China. Uh, but in fact, uh, cent uh, the central bank or the HMA um, still retains the control over the issue of bank, uh, bank notes because uh, there's a requirement that um, uh, when banks issue uh, bank notes, they need to have certificates of uh, indebtedness issued by the currency board to as a backing for, for those uh, uh, bank notes. Um, and for um, some central banks, including the HKMA, they also take the role of a, uh, a bank regulator. Um, so there's a function, important function of banking uh, supervision, which includes regulating and supervising the banking industry. But then not all central banks assume this function. Um, in some countries, there is a separate regulator for bank, banks and financial institutions, and they can be under one roof. Um, and in Hong Kong, I think um, the HMA assumes um, mo almost all of these functions, uh, in addition to maintaining monetary and financial stability, as well as uh, managing Hong Kong's foreign exchange reserves. Um, the HMA also has a mandate to maintain and develop Hong Kong as an international financial center. Uh, but given the time constraint here, um, today I will just focus on, on the monetary policy uh, function of the HKMA or like over the years of, of uh, the monetary authority, uh, which is actually the core function of a central bank. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, different central banks have different monetary regimes and can have different policy mandates. And so the question is, um, how do central banks determine the monetary regime? And before I talk about how we come to adopt uh, the uh, linked exchange rate system as uh, the monetary regime in Hong Kong, we need to understand one important concept in international economics that relates to the choice of monetary regime, that is the impossible trinity. Um, actually a central bank or, uh, or an economy has three choices of policy goals, namely exchange rate stability, free capital mobility, and independent monetary policy. Um, but then the uh, impossible trinity states that um, the three cannot be achieved at the same time such that we need to choose two out of three. Um, and to understand this, let's assume that an economy would like to lower the inflation by raising interest rates, uh, that is trying to um, deploy independent monetary policy. Um, and under full capital mobility or, full, uh, or, or free capital flows, in other words, um, the interest rate, when the interest rate becomes higher in an economy, there will be inflow of uh, foreign capitals to seek higher returns. And the inflow of funds will lead to an appreciation of the pressure of the local currency and therefore a fluctuation in the exchange rate. So as you can see, exchange rate stability cannot be achieved when independent monetary policy and free capital flows are already in place. And under free capital flows, therefore, one can only choose between either exchange rate stability, that is having a fixed exchange rate regime without any discretionary monetary policy, or having independent monetary policy. That is, they can have a flexible exchange rate regime or floating exchange rate regime with discretionary monetary policy, but then they can't control over the exchange rate. So this is really a policy choice for an economy to choose which two out of three corners of the policy goals. And as you know, nowadays, we run a linked exchange rate system in Hong Kong, 
under which the Hong Kong dollar is packed to the US dollar at a fixed rate of around 7.8 uh, Hong Kong dollars to, to, um, to one US dollar. And Hong Kong has therefore chosen to have only exchange rate stability and free capital mobility as its core policy goals. And of course, there are costs and benefits uh, of, uh, of all regimes, and there is no perfect regime. So whether a mon monetary regime is appropriate for an economy would depend very much on its economic structure and the legal mandates applied to it. And as Hong Kong is a small open economy uh, and an international uh, trade and financial center, there are enormous amounts of inflows and outflows uh, uh, to Hong Kong. Um, and so exchange rate stability is uh, a very important um, uh, to Hong Kong as it reduces the foreign exchange rate risks um, by exporters, importers, and international investors. And of course, a stable exchange rate would come with costs as well because we can't have discretionary monetary policy to adjust Hong Kong's interest rates. But then we need to know that uh, in a small open economy like Hong Kong, its scope for an effective monetary policy uh, would be limited anyway. And also in, in, uh, for Hong Kong, we have a very flexible um, economic structure that can help mitigate the cost by um, uh, uh, adjusting uh, to um, uh, the changes uh, through domestic prices. And so, so it's, all, it's, it's more about uh, balancing between the costs and benefits of, um, uh, of the regime to the economy. And that depends very much on the structure. So that gives you a sense or an idea of why we have so many different regimes in different economies. And, and you will see um, throughout the history of Hong Kong, um, we, we do have different uh, types of exchange rate regime, but, but still largely a fixed rate regime uh, over uh, the, uh, the past one and a half century. So let's go back in time to see how monetary regime in Hong Kong has evolved and how we ended up adopting the late exchange rate system. Um, in fact, Hong Kong's present day economy has its origins uh, as a British uh, colony in the mid 19th century. And back then Hong Kong was uh, an entrepot for trade with uh, mainland China. So it would be natural um, for traders to find it convenient to base their business on the monetary system which operated in the mainland. And, and that was the silver standard back then. So when Hong Kong first introduced its own currency, it was therefore based on silver, which means that the silver coinage and banknotes were exchangeable for silver. Uh, but the silver standard ended in mid-1935 when there was a global collapse uh, in metal prices after the Great Depression. And the government at that time decided that the anchor would be switched from silver to pound sterling. And to do so, uh, the exchange fund, which is the predecessor of the HKMA, was set up in 1935 by uh, the currency ordinance, which later renamed as uh, the exchange fund ordinance, which we, we have today. And the exchange fund purchased silver from the public, which was then sold in um, the uh, uh, London bullion market for uh, pound sterling. So um, the sterling standard um, lasted for about um, uh, 37 years, during which there was continued depreciation pressure for the sterling. And note that was, this was actually a period of considerable uncertainty and turmoil during which um, the British government had actually gone through changes in their own uh, monetary regime as well. And the British government ended the gold standard in uh, 1931 and the global monetary system had gone through also the rise and the fall of the Bretton Woods system after um, uh, the Second World War. And under the Bretton Woods system, um, gold was actually the basis for the US dollar and then other currencies, including all the major currencies were packed to the US dollars uh, value. And under this system, the sterling was packed to the US dollar at a fixed rate, but the UK government um, devalued it by uh, uh, 14% in 1967 due to some recurrent economic difficulties. And later on, the US also unilaterally terminate uh, the convertibility of US dollar to gold um, in 1971. And that puts an end to the Bretton Woods system. So the whole global um, monetary system uh, so went, went over a, a sea change. And then sterling then started to experience uh, large swings against the US, uh, US dollar. 
and with the exchange rate uh, falling by about 7% in one single month. And so in 1972, the exchange rate regime of the Hong Kong dollar was uh, switched to pack to the US dollar instead. But then um, the US dollar was still um, under pressure uh, despite its move to become a fiat currency. Um, and that's mainly due to its own economic problems. Uh, for example, back then they were facing um, high fiscal debt incurred as a result of the Vietnam War. And there was also the 1973 oil crisis and US deflation, which led to a confidence crisis in the US dollar. And given the lack of a suitable anchor elsewhere, um, the government of Hong Kong, um, uh, the, the choice of the government of Hong Kong is left with only uh, uh, letting Hong Kong dollar a free float. And the free float experience was um, satisfactory in the earlier years, but then towards the end of 1970s, uh, uh, the Hong Kong dollar experienced some weakening pressure. And the weakening pressure was further um, intensified by speculative attacks uh, and also by the confidence crisis surrounding the future of Hong Kong back in 1983. And the Hong Kong dollar weakened from 6.5 against the US dollar at the beginning of 1983 to 9.5 as quoted in this newspaper that you, uh, you see here. Uh, this paper was uh, dated um, 25th of September, 1983. Um, and the rescue plan for the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate was then to return to a fixed exchange rate system through requiring Hong Kong dollar banknotes to be issued and redeemed against the US dollar at the exchange rate of um, uh, 7.8 Hong Kong dollar to one US dollar. So there were three reasons for choosing US dollar as uh, the anchor at that time, uh, because the pound sterling was no longer a major international currency, whereas uh, the US dollar became the most dominant uh, international currency where financial markets with transactions in the US dollar rank first in terms of the depth, breadth, and liquidity, which remains true as of today. So this is how, as you see, this is how we come to adopt uh, the linked exchange rate system since 1983. So let us now try to understand a bit more about the operations of the linked exchange rate system. Um, the system is actually a currency board system, which is a rule-based monetary regime. Um, in fact, the, the modern day um, currency board regime has its origins in the British colonies. Um, they actually came to adopt it very widely in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and under the present day currency board arrangements, the linked exchange rate system um, requires the monetary base to be fully backed by foreign reserves and any change in the monetary base also to be fully backed uh, by a corresponding change in the foreign reserves. And the HKMA provides um, comfortability undertakings under which um, the HKMA commits to sell the Hong Kong dollars upon request um, by banks at the strong side comfortability undertaking of 7.75 per US dollar and also to buy Hong Kong dollars upon request by banks at the weak side convertibility undertaking of 7.85 per US dollar. So you have a convertibility zone of between 7.75 to 7.85. And under the currency board system, the stability of the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate is maintained through the firm commitment of the HKMA to honor the convertibility undertakings as well as an automatic uh, interest rate adjustment mechanism where interest rates rather than the exchange rate adjust to the inflow and outflow of funds. And this mechanism is illustrated here on this slide. So for example, if there, uh, in the case of uh, Hong Kong dollar outflows, the, Hong Kong, uh, the market exchange rate would weaken towards um, the weak side limit of 7.85. And upon banks request, the weak side convertibility undertaking would be triggered and then the HKMA would uh, purchase Hong Kong dollar from banks. And the monetary base would then contract and this tightened Hong Kong dollar liquidity uh, condition would then cause Hong Kong dollar interest rates to rise. And the high interest rates would then induce people to buy uh, Hong Kong dollar and which strengthens the exchange rate and keeps the Hong Kong dollar within the comfortability zone. 
And then the exact opposite uh, is true in the case of Hong Kong dollar uh, inflow. So um, I think uh, given that many of you will be interested in the legal aspect uh, governing the HKMA, um, I will spend some time to talk about the legal mandate of HKMA, especially in regard to uh, maintaining the monetary regime. Um, the HKMA was actually established uh, back in 1993 by combining the Office of Exchange Fund and the Office of the Banking Commissioner. And in terms of the governance and legal framework, the monetary authority is appointed under the exchange fund ordinance to assist the financial secretary in performing his functions under the exchange fund ordinance and to per perform such other functions as are assigned by other ordinances or by the financial secretary. And the Office of Monetary Authority is known as the HKMA, that is the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And the Monetary Authority is the chief executive of the HKMA. And the division of functions and responsibilities in monetary and financial affairs between financial secretary and the monetary authorities is set out in the exchange of letters uh, dated 25th of June, 2003. So the financial secretary defines the monetary policy objective as a stable Hong Kong dollar exchange rate at around 7.8 Hong Kong dollar uh, to one US dollar. And financial secretary also defines the structure of the monetary system as the currency board arrangements, which not only requires Hong Kong's monetary base to be backed by foreign reserves, but also require that changes in Hong Kong's monetary base must be met with an equivalent change in foreign reserves. And the monetary authority achieves the monetary policy objectives set by the financial secretary, including the strategy, the instrument, and um, the um, operate means of doing so. Um, and in doing so, the monetary authority also uh, maintains the stability and integrity of Hong Kong's monetary system. And besides the exchange fund ordinance and the, the letters between uh, uh, financial secretary and monetary authority, the basic law also sets up the broad principles for Hong Kong's financial system I have highlighted some key articles uh, of the basic law in this uh, slide. So I would just like to draw your attention to a few articles. Article 111 contains the central idea behind the currency board arrangement, which requires the issue of Hong Kong currency, which is a component of the monetary base to be fully backed by the reserve fund, which is the foreign reserve managed by the HMA currently. And article 113, further specifies that the exchange fund must be used primarily for maintaining the Hong Kong dollar st uh, stability. And articles uh, 110 and 112 ensure a free operation of business and no capital control should be in place. And above all, article 109 requires Hong Kong to maintain its status as an international financial center. So the, the present day currency board system that I have just presented to you is actually very much refined and effective. Uh, but actually throughout the, the uh, its operation for uh, nearly 40 years, there have been some major uh, refinements in the system along the way to shape the system to an effective and smooth one that we are seeing now. And the first major change occurred in 1988 and was referred to as accounting arrangements. Actually, before accounting arrangements, the government had no control over Hong Kong dollar liquidity condition in the banking system. And it was because uh, this interbank settlement function was actually carried out by one commercial bank, that is the HSBC. And therefore, the HSBC was often being called um, the quasi central bank of Hong Kong back then. And under the accounting arrangements, HSBC was uh, required to maintain an account with the exchange fund with a requirement that its balance with the exchange fund must be larger than the net clearing balance of other banks uh, at uh, uh, HSBC. And so because of this requirement, the government could regain monetary control indirectly. And the accounting arrangements continue to function until uh, 1996, before we have the real-time growth settlement, uh, which was set up. Um, and under this RTGS system, all banks in Hong Kong would now need to uh, set up its own clearing accounts with the HKMA and the sum of the clearing balance uh, of the banking system is now what we call the aggregate balance. Uh, 
And the RTGS also transferred also the um, settlement function from the HSBC back uh, to the government. And another major refinement to the late exchange rate system took place after the system was first put to the test uh, during the Asian financial crisis in 1997 to 98. So during the crisis, the Hong Kong dollar suffered a series of attacks by speculators. And the speculators actually came to Hong Kong after successfully forcing several Asian currencies to depreciate. And there was indeed weakening pressure of the Hong Kong dollar during the attack. Uh, and to prevent Hong Kong dollar exchange rate to weaken further, the HKMA actively intervened and used US dollar reserves to uh, 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 purchase Hong Kong dollar from banks. And the uh, intervention resulted in um, a decline in monetary base, which effectively lead to a contraction in Hong Kong dollar liquidity in the banking system and causing a rise in interbank rates. And there was actually a time when overnight interbank rates reached as high as 300% in 1997. And as the HMA actively stepped in, the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate remained firm and the higher interbank interest rate was transferred directly into higher borrowing cost uh, to the speculators and that's how the speculators lost money. But then the speculators came several rounds, um, although each time they found the attack on Hong Kong dollar exchange rate uh, unsuccessful. But then in the attack in 1998, they learned the double play strategy in which they slowly prefunded themselves with the Hong Kong dollars over a period of time, and then suddenly shorted the cash and the stock markets at the same time, and also sold um, the currency in large quantities to drive up interest rates. And so to restore market confidence, um, the HKME intervened in the stock market as well to counter uh, the speculative attack. And in hindsight, the intervention was timely and needed, and the linked exchange rate system was successfully defended. But then clearly, the, the double play strategy explode, exposed a couple of weaknesses in our uh, monetary system and required some strengthening. And so in 1998, the HKMA introduced seven technical measures. And I will just highlight a few of them here. Um, in fact, one most important feature uh, was the establishment of the, a clear convertibility undertaking for the Hong Kong dollar. So this was uh, actually a weak side commitment uh, back then. There was only the weak side, not yet having the, the strong side commitment in that the HKMA was ready to um, purchase unlimited amounts of Hong Kong dollar for US dollar to prevent a weakening of the currency beyond that rate. Uh, and in fact, before the introduction of this measure, the convertibility undertaking was not explicitly mentioned to banks. And so there, this created uncertainty as to, uh, to banks as to when the HKMA would intervene. And another uh, important measure was a formal definition of the monetary base and enlarging it significantly with the exchange fund papers, uh, which is the Hong Kong dollar debt securities issued by the HKMA. And uh, these exchange fund papers are uh, also uh, uh, backed fully by foreign reserves. And banks can then use um, these uh, exchange fund uh, papers uh, to assess uh, liquidity uh, through repos at the discount window. And apart from these seven technical measures, the HMA also increased um, the transparency of the system by publishing the size and component of the monetary base on a daily basis. And after the seven technical measures, uh, the Hong Kong dollar uh, exchange rate traded uh, pretty close to the uh, convertibility undertaking rate. And starting from late 2003, however, there were strong inflows into the Hong Kong dollar. And with Hong Kong dollar once appreciating abruptly to 7.7 in 2003. Um, and the strong um, Hong Kong dollar um, demand was due uh, partly to the weakness of um, the US dollar and partly to some unfounded speculation that the Hong Kong dollar would, depreci uh, would appreciate against the renminbi. And as this uh, convertibility is only um, applicable to the weak side, and so this, uh, uh, which allowed banks to convert Hong Kong dollar to US dollar at that time, the strong demand for Hong Kong dollar presented a credible challenge to the HKMA. And, seen, uh, and so in 2005, the HKMA introduced three refinements. So the first refinement is to establish also a strong side convertibility undertaking at 7.75. And so that would allow banks to convert the US dollar into Hong Kong dollar upon their requests. Um, and second, the weak side convertibility undertaking was moved to 7.8. Uh, 
uh, from 7.8 to 7.85 to allow symmetry, uh, uh, which created a compatibility zone would be from 7.75 to 7.85. And um, so the Hong Kong dollar is free to move within this comfortability zone. Um, so, um, so um, just uh, finally, just to conclude that you can see that um, Hong Kong's monetary regimes have gone through various shocks and the changes um, throughout its history over the past uh, one uh, over the past one and a half centuries. Um, and also the present day linked exchange rate system has also undergone major reforms over the past decades, uh, evolving into a rule-based currency uh, board system uh, with a, a high degree of transparency and credibility. And today the market operations of HKMA are triggered mainly by market participants through the commitment of the comfortability undertaking so that um, the, our intervention is, uh, is mainly passive. And so, and they're also conducted in strict conformity with cu uh, currency board principles. Um, so this was how um, the Hong Kong's uh, linked exchange rate system has become highly credible and effective, uh, which enabled it to withstand um, uh, the test of a number of financial crises and also uh, speculative attacks, and also some occasional skepticism uh, over the suitability of the system to the Hong Kong economy. Um, so, so with this, I would just um, end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. And uh, I hope that we will have a good discussion later. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Xi Chao. Um, I don't really have to introduce him. He is a professor and outstanding fellow here at CHK Law and uh, currently also serving as Associate Dean Research and Head of the Graduate Division of Law. Professor Xi Chao specializes in comparative corporate law, securities regulation, and financial regulation, with a particular focus, of course, on China. He's published extensively and is a um, often invited speaker at international conference and other um, events. Over to you, Xi Chao. Thank you very much, uh, Lutz, uh, for your very kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, uh, well, Ms. Dr. Chen's wonderful talk just now really uh, helpfully laid a very solid groundwork uh, for my talk, um, making uh, making especially the conceptual and, and uh, analytical part of uh, uh, this talk uh, a lot uh, easier. Now, um, I, I will say a few words uh, on the history of central banking uh, in mainland China uh, today. Now, central banking, as uh, Dr. Chen has uh, suggested, is is pretty much a a modern concept. Uh, it's a uh, it's a, uh, in a sense, it's a Western concept, which is uh, not particularly uh, familiar uh, to Imperial China. So, uh, but uh, in a way, uh, there appears to be some elements of central banking. Uh, if we look back uh, to the history um, uh, of, uh, of the country. Uh, now, for example, uh, there appears to be a long Chinese history uh, of, uh, of the state uh, or government or um, well, somehow uh, you have the backing of the government of the state uh, in the issuance of coins uh, and the paper notes. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, coins um, or primitive form of coins, um, uh, as you see uh, on the slide, uh, in the shape of a shell, for example, could uh, be dated back uh, to late uh, Shang Dynasty. Uh, that would be about uh, 3,000 years ago. Now, uh, we uh, also appear to have some evidence of state-backed uh, or state-sponsored uh, uh, um, issuance uh, of paper notes, uh, which could be traced back to uh, the Song Dynasty, which is uh, about uh, about 2,000 uh, years uh, from today. Now, uh, but um, coming from the more modern perspective, um, now the central bank is a uh, is a creation pretty much uh, at the turn of um, turn of the century. Uh, last century. Now, uh, before that, in the Qing Dynasty, for example, there was a uh, what might be called as a bi-metallic uh, uh, system of uh, the, the Qing, uh, uh, Qing government using silver, uh, unminted silver, and uh, minted copper, copper uh, coins um, as, as the very basis of uh, its uh, fiscal uh, system. Now, that system appeared to have worked uh, well uh, until uh, until uh, the trade imbalance. Um, very much um, resulting from uh, the, the international trade um, uh, between the Qing and China back then and the rest of the world, especially uh, the export of tea um, and the silk uh, to, uh, 
uh, to the rest of the world resulted uh, in an inflow of silver um, into uh, into Qing, into China back then. Now, as uh, uh, as Dr. Chen just uh, indicated, uh, back then you had a, a, a dominance, a predominance of the silver-based uh, system. Now. Uh, that uh, trade imbalance uh, presumably has uh, contributed uh, to the first opium war. Now, uh, then uh, clearly uh, the, the notion uh, of modern banking, the notion of uh, the idea of central banking uh, started off um, uh, pretty much uh, with the use of modern banking in, uh, for example, the, the, the treaty port uh, cities. Now, uh, it may be, uh, it has been argued uh, that uh, China's um, uh, first central bank was uh, was the so-called the Great Qing Board of uh, Revenue Bank, uh, which was set up back in 1905, uh, and was three years later was renamed as Great Qing Bank. Um, now, but uh, that was probably a bit uh, uh, a bit uh, debatable. Now, um, uh, it was uh, uh, not until 1927 uh, that uh, uh, well in Chinese history uh, the first central bank or the bank with the name of the central bank. Uh, was first uh, created by the nationalist um, uh, Republican uh, government uh, back then. Now, um, uh, back in 1935, uh, as a milestone, uh, well, uh, or, uh, or uh, the China's uh, China's national legal tender was uh, was first issued, uh, and that pretty much sp spelled the end of the silver standard uh, in China. Uh, uh, in that uh, year. Now, with only with the benefit of hindsight, um, the, the issuance, um, uh, the, the abandoning uh, of the silver standard uh, back in 1935 uh, was perhaps a bit uh, ill-timed uh, because uh, the, the nationalist government uh, then uh, very soon found itself in the position of uh, keep on uh, keep on printing uh, printing cash, printing the FABI, uh, while the national, uh, then national legal tender uh, in its uh, in its uh, arms program to fend off the Japanese evasion. Now, as a consequence of that, uh, there was uh, there was a, uh, what can be called a hyperinflation. Uh, the value of FABI or the value of uh, the national government uh, currency uh, uh, depreciated by hundreds of times. Uh, so that uh, before the fall of uh, the nationalist government in the mainland, uh, there was a last ditch attempt to really to try to reform this uh, system, which uh, is uh, this campaign of uh, uh, gold yuan or gongyun, qing yuan quan, back uh, in the late uh, late 1940s. Uh, that, but that was pretty much uh, the history before 1948. Now, uh, starting from the founding of the People's Republic, now there appears to be a few stages. Um, where the, cent the, the notion of central banking, the role of central banking uh, in Chinese economy and the Chinese financial system has uh, evolved uh, in a, uh, sometimes in a quite uh, dramatic way. Now, uh, as a matter of convenience, there's probably no, uh, no easy way of uh, dividing, uh, dividing the decades uh, starting from 1949 uh, to now, but uh, uh, just as a matter of convenience, I broadly divided uh, this, uh, this uh, history into a few phases. Now, the first phase can be regarded as a, uh, the so-called essential planning uh, era, which is pretty much uh, the, the three decades um, starting from 1949 all the way through 1979. Now, uh, let me just give you a, a bit of a, a bit of an economic historical background as to the very broad um, uh, economic uh, background uh, of uh, central banking uh, in that uh, phase. Now, uh, as uh, perhaps many of you would appreciate, uh, back in the early 1950s, uh, there was a national nationalization campaign uh, 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 going on uh, in the mainland. Uh, th that campaign was very much as a, a result of that campaign. Uh, the idea of um, uh, private ownership in banking industry pretty much came to a, a almost a complete end. Uh, now, uh, so for example, Bank of Communication, which was founded back in 19, uh, 1908, uh, was closed down. Uh, Bank of China, uh, well, depending how you look at it, some would argue um, it probably was founded back in 1905, uh, was pretty much reduced to uh, uh, somehow close to irrelevance. And so at some point, uh, it was staffed by a, a, a small number of bankers, uh, pretty much specialized in the settlement of international trade, uh, which was uh, pretty much limited uh, for, uh, for that uh, period um, uh, of time. 
Now, uh, from the broader uh, economic point of view, uh, back uh, then, during that period, uh, China pretty much followed the suit uh, of the former Soviet Union uh, and the practice what is uh, commonly known, known as a central planned uh, economy. Now, uh, the idea uh, behind this, uh, this economic arrangement, which uh, obviously uh, was a competitor uh, with uh, the so-called market-based or market-oriented economy, uh, was that all resources, uh, including including capital uh, and the credit, uh, would be allocated administratively by the government in accordance with a plan made in advance by the central planning organizations uh, in, in Beijing. So uh, in that sense, uh, back then, uh, for example, capital investment projects, uh, the setup of, uh, of enterprise, um, the, the, uh, well, uh, the, very much the capital investment into a major, uh, for example, infrastructure project was not supported by way of a, uh, of a credit um, uh, process, but pretty much by way of a, a government allocation, uh, which, was, which was done uh, centrally. Now, so it was very much in this background, uh, the, the central banking, uh, uh, it, could, it could be argued there was not too much of a central banking uh, in China uh, back then. Now, uh, to, to get to this, uh, that kind of uh, conclusion, uh, one needs to look at uh, the role of um, the People's Bank of China, um, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the central bank uh, of uh, the country. Now, the PBOC, the Central Bank of China was, um, uh, was set up back in, uh, 1948. Now, uh, starting from the, uh, the early 1950s, um, PBO, uh, PBOC uh, generally was, from legal legalistic point of view, was generally was regarded a part of uh, the Chinese uh, Chinese government, uh, and uh, the PBOC was pretty much set up that way. Uh, it uh, mirrored, in terms of the organizational structure, it mirrored the structure of uh, the Chinese government. Uh, uh, and, uh, for example, uh, at the central level, at the national level, is one uh, headquarters of the PBOC. And for every single province, uh, you would have a branch of the PBOC. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, py uh, pyramidal uh, structure just uh, spans span all the way uh, to uh, to the county level uh, in China, so it's pretty much, if you like, uh, it's uh, an embedded part of the Chinese uh, government. Now, uh, when it comes to the role of the PBOC, uh, it uh, back in that period, PBOC was pretty much the so-called uh, monobank. It was uh, very much the all, virtually the only bank, uh, with the mine exception of the Bank of China, uh, in the country. Now, so back then, the PBOC had uh, a bit of a central banking function. As, uh, as Dr. Chen has just indicated, uh, was rather with a focus on, for example, the issue of notes and the coins, uh, the setting of interest rates uh, for deposits and loans, which were, uh, especially for loans, were pretty much limited. Uh, and the PBOC also assumed quite a bit of a commercial banking function, uh, such as collection of household deposits, uh, handling of remittances and settlements. Uh, and when it comes to credit extension, uh, there wasn't much. Uh, PBOC back then was pretty much was uh, was seen as a cashier uh, uh, for disbursement of enterprise working capital. Uh, remember, all the capital investment uh, was pretty much done uh, by uh, by way of a government administrative allocation. So that was uh, uh, the very limited role of central banking uh, in the first three decades uh, of the People's Republic. Now. Um, if we were to move on from uh, that period, uh, then the next 15 years, next 14 years, uh, was the period which can be regarded as a, a transitional period, uh, where uh, when China transitioned from, uh, from this uh, centrally planned economy, uh, over time, gradually to be a more market-based uh, e economy. So uh, during this period, uh, as a very much as a, as a matter of legacy from, uh, from the centrally planned economy, uh, SOEs, when it comes to their, their funds, uh, it initially, uh, in, in the early years of this period, it just came from uh, the Chinese government fiscal uh, grants. Uh, that system worked out uh, just about fine uh, until the rise of the private sector or the revival of the private sector uh, and uh, very much the rise of uh, the foreign investment uh, enterprise sector posed uh, great challenges uh, in both the markets, uh, product markets and the services markets for the SOE. So as pretty much as a result of that, <clears throat> uh, SOEs in China, 
uh, the performance deteriorated, uh, resulting in a, uh, in, in a massive fiscal deficit for the Chinese governments. Um, uh, so the solution uh, back then uh, was really a fundamental shift uh, from uh, the, the traditional uh, fiscal grants uh, to support SOEs uh, to, to bank loans um, uh, provide, to be provided by the specialized banks. Uh, the intention back then obviously was to, to impose financial disciplines uh, on uh, SOEs. Now, that was the plan, uh, that was the strategy, but that strategy appears uh, appears uh, to be pretty much uh, a uh, some somewhere uh, close to uh, a failure uh, because apparently credit credit decisions by uh, the newly then newly created Chinese commercial banks were pretty much subject to, subject to intensive government intervention. Uh, so uh, what was prevalent back then was the so-called policy lending. Now. Uh, under which commercial banks uh, in the country, they extended uh, credits, uh, they extended loans uh, under the direction, uh, in many cases, in, on, on many occasions, uh, by uh, the governments to support local uh, projects, which, are regard which were regarded as significant to the locality, uh, and also to provide uh, financial support to otherwise commercially, business-wise, um, unviable SOEs. Uh, now, uh, that is kind of practice which uh, we, which was well documented. Uh, so as you can see on the slide, uh, while the so-called policy lending, uh, while non-commercial lending, uh, accounted for about one third of bank loans uh, back then. Now, uh, you could imagine uh, 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 as a result of this, non-performing loan uh, problems uh, emerged uh, and it snowballed, uh, and the size of non-performing loans uh, grow to such a scale. Uh, that as at, uh, at the turn of the century, it was uh, reported later that the non-performing loan ratio uh, for the bank, Chinese banking sector was as high as about 25%. So technically, uh, at that point, uh, while the whole of the Chinese uh, banking sector was uh, uh, technically uh, speaking bankrupt. Now that uh, uh, really sets the background uh, of the role of central banking uh, during that period. Uh, so number one, you have uh, uh, as, as a reform initiative, you have a break up, break up of the monobank system, uh, PBOC's non-central bank fun uh, non-central banking functions uh, was uh, carved off. You have uh, uh, three specialized bank, uh, which are predecessors of CCB, ABC, and the ICBC uh, being created. Uh, but when it comes to, to the central banking function, the PBOC's, uh, well, pretty much played one simple uh, simple uh, role, which is really to set an annual credit plan for the nation as a whole. Uh, and for each of the specialized bank, uh, uh, PBOC set a, a specific uh, credit uh, allocation quota uh, for each of the specialized bank. But um, as a matter of reality, uh, well, the actual credit growth consistently cons exceeded uh, the PBOC plan. So that, that was, um, uh, that was uh, how uh, PBOC functioned um, in terms of essential banking function uh, during that period. Now, the next period was uh, in a way a bit more exciting. Uh, the central banking uh, function uh, uh, came uh, came to be uh, to be codified. Uh, so in 1995, uh, the first law, the first Chinese law uh, on uh, central banking on PBOC was promulgated. Uh, now which uh, which really uh, highlighted, uh, well, uh, there was an anecdote uh, which really highlighted uh, the, the difficulty uh, for, uh, for the notion, for the idea of central banking to emerge uh, in, uh, in this transitional economy. Now, uh, back in 1995, uh, when the PBOC law was passed by the National People's Congress, uh, it, was, uh, it was reported later that the legislative bill uh, was passed by a very narrow margin, uh, which was extraordinary uh, for the PRC legislative uh, history. Now, much of that resistance by, uh, by the delegates uh, to, to the National Peace Congress was Article 30 of the PBOC law, which reads, uh, the PBOC shall not basically prohibited uh, PBOC from lending to the local governments, uh, all government agencies at all various levels. Uh, and it also prohibits uh, the PBOC from providing guarantee uh, to any institutions or individuals. So uh, as you can tell, uh, with the idea of uh, PBOC uh, and the banking system uh, uh, supporting the government, supporting the government uh, favored uh, projects, this was uh, something which, uh, which really uh, uh, deviated from that traditional notions. 
so the PBOC back in that pe period also was in pursuit uh, of independence. Now, a, a very significant development back then uh, was really to decouple the PBOC local presence uh, from the provin provincial uh, structure uh, in, in the country. So rather than for, uh, for PBOC to set up one branch for each of the province, uh, the PBOC uh, provincial branches were regrouped uh, into regional branches. So that was uh, reportedly was uh, inspired by the Federal Reserve uh, regional system uh, that uh, you see uh, in the United States. Now that's, um, uh, that's one very important development. Uh, a second very important development uh, is the notion of monetary policy uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Chen has just indicated. Uh, now, so under the PBOC law, uh, a committee, uh, the so-called monetary policy committee was, uh, uh, is set up, uh, but it's very important to note that um, um, this role, uh, the, the, especially this uh, monetary policy making role uh, was uh, only a advisory for the PBOC. Uh, so monetary policy committee uh, under the PBOC uh, is created uh, as an advisory body rather than decision-making body. Uh, it is created as an advisory body to the state council to the Chinese central government. Uh, so the very notion of central, uh, central bank uh, being independent uh, from the Chinese central government uh, is not a notion which is endorsed uh, by uh, the PRC national legislation. Now, uh, the current uh, phase, uh, this is pretty much uh, where we are. Now, this is a period of time uh, when the notion of central banking uh, is gaining a lot of prominence. Uh, now, um, at, uh, uh, central to this, uh, uh, this, uh, this development uh, is uh, very much uh, the soul searching uh, quest for the PBOC uh, to really to determine uh, the so-called monetary policy objectives. Uh, what are the goals uh, for monetary policies? Um, now, Article 3 of the PBOC law, for example, uh, is not terribly uh, explicit uh, uh, in respect of uh, the objectives of, uh, of uh, money, monetary policy of the PBOC. It, did, it does say uh, it is, uh, well, for the PBOC, it's very important to maintain the stability of the value of the currency. Uh, and, but in the meantime, there's an indication that promotion of economic growth uh, is also very important. Now, uh, so basically you have this due, uh, due monetary objectives, uh, which uh, are stated uh, in uh, the PBOC, the central banking law. Now, uh, uh, now there's, um, well, from, uh, from, uh, from a, a practical point of view, there appears, appears to be uh, inherent tensions between these two uh, objectives, uh, due very much to China's patterns of economic economic growth uh, until very recently, which is investment driven, uh, which is, uh, well, promotion of economic growth uh, might uh, run uh, from time to time into conflict with the stability of the value of the currency. Uh, so as you can see, uh, over time, uh, there's uh, policy, uh, policy preferences, the policy, um, uh, uh, the, strat the strategies, uh, they, uh, they shifted over time, uh, but uh, uh, it can be, uh, uh, it can be uh, seen really as a process of the PBOC, the central bank uh, in China, uh, really engaged in the process uh, of, uh, of, uh, of identifying uh, really th those objectives which uh, are important uh, for the Chinese uh, financial uh, and uh, Chinese uh, uh, financial system, Chinese economy. Now, um, this is also the period where uh, when the PBOC also uh, uh, gained a lot of experience, uh, PBOC, the central banking, the role of central banking uh, is becoming uh, more mature. Now, traditionally, uh, PBOC, the central bank uses uh, what might be regarded as more traditional uh, instruments, uh, for example, in the adjustment of interest rate, re the use of rate discount, um, the use of uh, re reserve requirement. But over time, the PBOC is using, uh, is placing much greater emphasis uh, on many new liquidity uh, management tools, which are uh, more commonly seen uh, in uh, many of the more uh, mature markets. Um, uh, and also during this period, uh, the PBOC, the central banking, uh, the central bank itself uh, has been regarded really uh, as, uh, as the primary force uh, um, uh, for reform uh, initiatives, financial reform initiatives in the country. Now these include uh, interest rate liberalization, uh, uh, these include uh, a, uh, a shift from the traditional pact system uh, from what is known as the managed floating exchange rate regime, uh, which uh, obviously allows uh, the market uh, to play a much greater role uh, for the determination of exchange rate uh, between RMB and the foreign currencies. Uh, and it's also in this period, um, while you, we 
uh, have seen uh, quite a bit of reform initiative in terms of a capital account convertibility in China uh, and uh, in favor of uh, internationalization uh, of the Chinese currency uh, RMB. Now, it is also in this period uh, that the PBOC, the central bank, uh, is uh, gaining a lot of uh, 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 regulatory prominent, uh, prominence, uh, especially in the last few years. Uh, PBOC has really emerged as a ZER coordinator uh, for, uh, for financial regulation uh, in the country. Now, uh, in, respect, in respect of shadow banking, in respect of uh, financial holding companies, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, it has really emerged as being de designated as a secretariat uh, of the State Council Financial Stability and Development uh, Committee. Now, so this is rather a, a very brief uh, overview uh, of the role of central banking uh, in uh, the country, in mainland China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a second fascinating talk. Um, and with this, we are moving on to Singapore. Uh, Professor Christian Hoffman, our next speaker, is Associate Professor at NUS Faculty of Law. Prior to joining NUS, he was a senior legal counsel for the German Central Bank and a professor of private and business law at the private university in the Principality of Liechtenstein. He held several further research and teaching appointments with law faculties in Europe, North, Af North America and Asia. And uh, he holds seven law degrees from three jurisdictions. Um, his focus, the focus of his work, his research is banking law, financial regulation, comparative company law, European Union law and comparative private law in civil law systems. He has widely published and we are looking forward to his presentation. Well, thank you very much Dean Wolf for the kind introductions and also for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, my presentation, as you will see, um, of course, um, has uh, several similarities to the presentations before. And I'm very grateful, of course, to the other speakers therefore to have provided um, so instructively uh, the, the stage for now the third and final presentation, which focuses on Singapore Central Bank. Okay. Now, when I was asked to present the Monetary Authority of Singapore from a historic perspective, I asked myself, what are the significant or the remarkable aspects of Singapore Central Bank? Is there anything specific about it? And I came up with the following points. One is that it is um, quite extraordinary still these days, although we see some sort um, of um, an accumulation of regulatory and supervisory powers in, in one institution around the world. But it is still remarkable that Singapore only has one institution which is charged with the regulation and supervision of the entire financial sector. And in addition to that is also Singapore Central Bank. Because the prevailing uh, model around the world is uh, to either limit the central bank to issuing the local currency and monetary policy, or to also, in addition to that, task it with some regulatory and supervisory um, duties, but then usually limited, as is the case in Hong Kong, um, to the regulation supervision of the of the banking sector. But in Singapore, it's really uh, it's really tasked with the regulation supervision of the entire financial sector, including even the insurance sector. Uh, following from that, of course, and I'll show the relevant statutory provision of the MAS Act in my next slide, um, is that Singapore's central bank is tasked with a multitude of tasks and objectives. Now, when we then focus, and this is just as like, um, especially um, Dr. Chung, before me, I want to strongly emphasize uh, the monetary policy side of things because monetary policy is still the most um, authentic of a central bank's function that it serves. Um, what we will see when we discuss the monetary policy operations of the MAS, it has chosen a different route than most other central banks and therefore that therefore warrants further explanation. That should be a focus of this talk as well. And finally, I was years ago when I came to Singapore surprised by the fact that 
Singapore at the MAS only started issuing the Singapore dollar in 2002, prompting me to ask what, who issued it before. And also given that Singapore uh, is a relatively young country, which um, has only gained um, independence in 1965. Um, the question that arises also is what means of payment were actually used in Singapore prior to the establishment of the Singapore dollar. Now, just as a brief overview, um, the MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore was established in 1971. Um, that followed um, the 1970 Parliamentary Act. Um, Parliament passed in 1970 the Monetary Authority of Singapore Act, uh, which is still in force, of course, with several amendments over the years. And um, the initial task of this monetary authority was relatively limited to what we see today. It was supposed to supervise Singapore's financial system, which of course is still this, the case today, but of course Singapore's financial market was very small at the start, consisted mostly of relatively small locally operating banks. Secondly, it was tasked with the management of Singapore's reserves. Here again, there wasn't much of a task at the start, but as I will explain today, uh, the MAS administers uh, vast amounts of foreign reserves and therefore it's today a very important task of the MAS. Later on, additional tasks were added, especially it was tasked with the development of Singapore as a regional and international financial center, which is also something quite extraordinary for a central bank. In some jurisdictions, one would see that as a conflict or potential conflict with um, the monetary policy task, but not so in Singapore where when one reads supports, it seems to really have worked well uh, for the financial market to be supervised and developed by the same kind of institution. But of course, as MAS emphasizes, um, different departments um, exist, which are in charge of the regulatory supervisory side on the one hand and the development side on the other. An important task that followed also was to conduct monetary policy. As we just said, as we already said, this primary, this most important role that the central bank needs to play. However, initially it was seen as a relatively secondary and indistinctly defined task. When one reads statements, uh, early time statements of the MAS, um, there is no hiding that the MAS had to find its way into this new task by initially um, mostly directing at the banks uh, giving directions, very specific directions to the banks, which was possible, as we said, because it was a very small financial market with very few actors. But then, of course, when the market grew, the importance of the Singapore dollar grew, the influx of capital grew enormously. Um, conducting monetary policy became a very challenging task. And of course, then um, the operations were modernized and are now completely up to date with what is being done around the world. Now this slide is the only really legalistic slide which uh, one would ex expect in the presentation of a lawyer um, because it's the legal framework um, under which or this one provision is the, the key one because it outlines the legal framework under which um, the MAS operates because in this one provision here section four of the MAS Act we find all the objectives and the tasks of this central bank. And when one reads the tasks and the objectives, one should always start reading the tasks because these are really the operations that the central bank conducts on a daily basis. Secondly, one should look at the objectives because, and this is where the legal aspect really comes in, the, all the tasks need to be understood and read in light of the objectives, meaning all that the central bank does on a daily basis 
needs to pursue certain objectives or goals, needs to be understood in this kind of a way. And here, just on a side note, uh, maybe I would like to uh, make a reference to um, Professor Chao Xi's very interesting uh, presentation and his reference to Article 30 of the PBOC law, uh, this provision on the ban of monetary state financing, which uh, it now forms part of, the, of China's uh, um, central bank legal framework as well. It is something which, of course, is a, is a very important and probably, legally speaking, the most important aspect when one looks at central banks. The, state on, the ban on monetary state financing is a relatively new development, but we see it explicitly in more and more central bank acts. And it can, as we see from recent experience, actually lead to legal disputes. So far, I'm only aware of one jurisdiction where it has repeatedly led to legal disputes, meaning where a central bank was actually controlled by courts, whether its monetary policy transactions were compatible with the legal framework under which it operates. This jurisdiction is the Eurozone and the central banks which had to defend their monetary policies are the European Central Bank and those national central banks of the member states of the Euro system. So it is not a purely theoretical question, and it is not just politically accountable. It may even be legally challenged, depending, of course, um, what kind of, um, well, legal avenues to really seek um, decisions by court exist in specific jurisdictions. So when we look at this provision here at, um, in the Monetary Authority uh, of Singapore Act, we find, as I said, the four key tasks here named functions, which is um, just a synonym, uh, uh, synonymous terminology, we find four tasks. Firstly, to act as the Central Bank of Singapore, conduct monetary policy, issue currency, oversee payment systems, and serve as banker to and financial agent of the government. This task is really the key task of all central banks. That's what makes an institution truly a central bank. Secondly, to conduct integrated supervision of the financial services sector and financial stability surveillance. As I said, it is kind of extraordinary that Singapore has only one such institution, but here we are. It therefore conducts the supervision of the entire financial sector um, on its own. It also is tasked with the management of the official foreign reserves of Singapore. That once again is a very typical task for central banks. And then fourthly, it's also tasked with the development of Singapore as an international financial center. And that, I said it before, is kind of unconventional. And all of this now has to be read in light of the objectives to maintain price stability, to foster a sound and reputable financial center, and to promote financial stability, to ensure prudent and effective management of the official foreign reserves of Singapore, and to grow Singapore as an internationally competitive financial center. A lot of these of objectives, but applicable by the multitude of tasks that this central bank also pursues. The important one that I want to focus on is the first one to maintain price stability when I speak about monetary policy. Now, the currency issue, as I said before, uh, only or MAS only started issuing its uh, the Singapore dollar in 2004 at uh, 2002 before that it was issued by the board of commissioners of the currency this board of commissioners of currency Singapore was established in 1967 with the enactment of the currency act and it continued um, the currency board system that one had seen before uh, during the British colonial times. This new Singapore dollar, which um, was issued by the board for the first time in June 1967, was fully convertible to um, the pound sterling at that time and also fully backed by foreign assets or gold. We remember, of course, 1967, those were the times of the, of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was also uh, mentioned several times today already, therefore pegging of currencies to other currencies and also um, the backing 
um, of currencies by gold or by foreign assets was still a common standard. Abolished then, of course, in the 1970s. And therefore, this, is, this also explains why monetary policy was very rudimentary at the start, because if currency, currencies are packed um, and also there is a backing uh, to foreign assets or gold, um, monetary policy transactions do not are not as essential just yet or don't need to be as sophisticated as is the case nowadays where we have no Bretton Woods anymore and where full backing by foreign assets or gold is a disappearing phenomenon as well. Now, this important task, which, which um, means the task to issue Singapore's currency was transferred to the MAS with the aim of increasing efficiency and eliminating duplicate functions without compromising its objectives. Now, I only want to say briefly something about financial regulation supervision, which of course is a very important task, but not the key task when one looks at its function, at its role as a central bank. Um, when one reads old, old materials from MAS, it's very interesting how um, openly here again, it is explained that the 1970s were a learning period and for the, for the um, officers of MAS and that um, MAS in those times regulated more informally and by dialogue than it would do this these days. Um, it is broadly described how MAS officers met with the banking industry for lunches, for dinners to informally actually hear what the concerns of the industry were and informally give guidance, which was then supposed to be followed. In the 80s and 90s, these informal approaches were no longer possible because the financial sector had expanded dramatically and uh, therefore one moved on to formalized approaches to regulation supervision by legally binding acts. It was also considered that one needed to have an arm's length relationship so that this close relationship with the banking industry or the wider financial industry was no longer possible. It became more and more complex as well, more diversified with the growing uh, financial sector. And the concept of supervised self-regulation was introduced, of course, that reflects also the approach of Basel, um, Basel regulation of banking uh, supervision, where one does not even try to supervise every single um, um, transaction of the financial sector anymore, but leaves self-regulation to the financial institutions, but supervises these mechanisms, these concepts, and, and um, thereby uh, tries to catch irregularities and risks before they materialize. In the 90s, in the late 90s and 2000s, we saw in Singapore, just as in the rest of the world, um, the impact of globalization really um, uh, kicking up. Uh, competition became harsher among the banks, among the financial institutions, followed by a wave of consolidations. And uh, regulation became much more complex because of these, the global presence of financial institutions and cross-border um, activities. The focus therefore had to change Whereas this uh, financial stability focus, which is one of the objectives that the MAS has to pursue, was um, really targeted at preventing any collapse of any individual financial institution operating in Singapore, that was deemed no longer possible. But instead, one focused on systemic risk, which would, in the worst case scenario, even allow for the collapse of an individual firm, but one needed to protect the market from a spread of contagion in such situations when that occurred. As I said, only brief remarks um, regarding uh, the financial um, regulation and supervision. I wanna to move to the core part, which is discussion of the monetary policy operations. And as I said before, uh, MAS at the very start, meaning in the 70s, like the clear and the potent mechanism for monetary policy, it watched indicators such as interest rates, exchange rate, the monetary base, loan growth, to assess whether the economy was overheating with the result, of course, that uh, inflationary tendencies uh, became visible. How did it respond to such overheating tendencies in what it called itself a flexible and pragmatic way, uh, mostly by way of regulatory me uh, mechanisms which were targeted at bank lending, for example, it required the banks to hold higher amounts 
in their reserve accounts, thereby taking this money, which now was locked away in the reserve accounts of the banks of the central bank, um, took them out of the market and therefore stopped the overheating of the economy. It could also order the banks to raise their interest rates by what would today be considered a very unconventional way, meaning by direct directions aimed at the banks, which required them to raise interest rates by a certain percentage point. That was possible back then because in the early days, banks were actually allowed to set interest rates through cartel arrangements. So it was very easy for MAS to direct banks to raise their interest rates. The current predominant objective is, as I said before, um, the pursuit of monetary policy of, of, of stability, of price stability, which is understood as low and stable inflation in Singapore. And with this objective, the MAS aims to protect the purchasing power of the Singapore dollar, to preserve the value of savings in Singapore dollars, keep prices predictable for businesses. All of these objectives are definitely shared with other central banks around the world, which focus on price stability. And in addition to that, also to attract long-term investments into Singapore. And here, what happens is very interesting. Singapore decided to deviate from the prevailing approach around the world because globally, those central banks that focus on price stability target interest rates. And it brings me back, of course, to Dr. Chung's um, explanation about the impossible trinity Singapore faced here the dilemma, if it were to target interest rates, it would at the same time not be able to target exchange rates, given that it is, has always been a, an open market economy with um, very strong influx, but also allowing out, uh, outflows, of course, of, of capital. So instead, instead of choosing targeting interest rates, as the majority of banks do, it impacts exchange rates of the Singapore dollar and between the Singapore dollar and those currencies of Singapore's main trade partners. Sometimes you find also the wording of the main trade partners and main competitors. Why so? Because MAS learned from experience in the early days and now considers that exchange rate targeting is way more effective for price stability than interest rate targeting. Because of its openness and dependence on imports, um, interest rates are really the key mechanism. Targeting interest rates is the main uh, uh, mechanism for the MAS to influence both the money supply and also to combat inflations. Um, why is that so? Because while in large economies, that was the slide before, which I just skipped, Domestic production and consumption are the main price driving factors. But in Singapore, in a small export and investment oriented economy with massive dependence on imports, import prices and direct capital investments exercise the strongest impact on inflation. And it helps Singapore, of course, that um, it consistently ran strong surpluses and therefore did not see a need to impact, meaning depress interest rates and inflate the money supply which would otherwise could have happened had it seen um, massive recessions and if government um, indebtedness would have skyrocketed, it would have been very, very difficult to pursue this approach, but that was never the case. And therefore this focus on exchange rates was the most promising approach to um, Singapore's monetary policy. So what um, does it do? Um, it, in times of high inflation, coupled with strong economic growth, it is clear what MAS is supposed to do. It depreciates the Singapore dollar and thereby counters higher import prices, which brings consumer index prices down. In the same time, at the same time, also slows investment inflows and therefore also lowers export volumes, but that has a positive effect on inflation as well in so far as domestic production is being reduced and labor costs go down. So all of these factors, of course, while stifling the economy have a positive effect because they bring down inflation. In the opposite scenario, in a recession, the Singapore dollar obviously has to depreciate. 
Um, and how does Singapore exactly do that? Ip appreciate or depreciate the Singapore dollar in uh, comparison to foreign currencies? Now, it became possible, as I said before, after the end of Bretton Woods, and Singapore never pursued the policy of a fixed pack, which means it never fixed its currency to any other currency. Instead, it pursues what it calls the nominal effective exchange rate approach. So it monitors the value of the Singapore dollar against a basket of currencies representing Singapore's major trading partners, and it never discloses which currencies exactly fall into this basket. It then allows the Singapore dollar to fluctuate within a clearly defined band to these target foreign currencies. And it also adjusts this band to avoid misalignment. So if, for instance, it thinks that the Singapore dollar should appreciate together with certain other currencies, it might have to adjust the band um, so these are the three mechanisms that it applies. And with this focus on exchange rates, the MAS moved from direct regulatory controls, as I said before, these reserve requirements, the credit guidelines directed at banks to modern mechanisms, meaning market operations. What are these market operations? Now, um, Singapore, the, the MAS injects more liquidity into the markets or devalues the Singapore dollar um, by selling Singapore dollars in exchange for US dollars. Thereby it builds up foreign reserves, which then allows it to intervene in the opposite direction, to sell its US dollar denominated assets, thereby providing more US dollars into the market and, assume, and, and uh, absorbing Singapore dollars, thereby contracting the supply of uh, Singapore dollars in the market. And, here again, the point of government surplus is very important because it means that other negative impacts um, on the economy can be softened by fiscal policy. A good example is the following. While central banks around the world that focus on price stability look at consumer price indices, they do and have to a certain extent probably to ignore what happens to asset prices especially those of endable goods uh, of land and the like. If fiscal policy has the financial means to intervene, it can interfere here, bring asset prices down by fiscal measures and therefore leaves the, or gives the central bank the freedom to focus fully on its, on its focus, which is price stability as far as consumer indices are concerned. Now I know that I'm, running out of time and therefore um, the slides will be will be made available um, to everyone so therefore I have quite a few details about currencies in use in Singapore prior to the inception of the Singapore dollar. Uh, I won't go through them slide by slide but what's important is that um, Singapore as the rest of the world of course reflected this uh, process of going from coins, coins with inherent value, uh, mostly silver dollars, predominantly it was the Mexican and the Spanish Singapore dollar, uh, uh, Mexican and Spanish uh, silver dollar, uh, which was used in Singapore during uh, the times when it formed part of the Strait Settlement and uh, later on became a British Crown Colony. It moved then on to notes being issued by banks because of all the disadvantages that came with the pure usage of coins. There was a, a shortage of coins, transportation costs, holding costs and the like. So the next move was then to allow banks to issue, that was all during British colonial times, of course, to allow banks to issue notes, notes promising to pay a certain amount of silver dollars upon the presentation of this note that was issued by the bank. Problems arose, of course, because this all depended, of course, on the capability and the willingness of the bank to actually meet its obligations. And therefore, when we saw a lot of defaults by the banks, the situation was considered unsustainable. The British government moved in and started issuing its own coins and ultimately its own notes. However, it was never the British pound sterling, which was the legal tender 
in Singapore as well as the other uh, straight settlements and uh, and and uh, the the protectorate of Malaya, which was under British rule. It was never the pound sterling. It was other currencies issued specifically for this region, but convertible into pound sterling for the longest time pegged to the pound sterling and for as long as the gold standard was still in force in uh, Great Britain, thereby um, uh, secured by the gold standard. Um, as I said, the slides give um, details on that. Um, maybe the last point, um, if somebody's interested in further information, there is an MAS publication, 40 years of MAS, which is now already 10 years old because this year MAS will be um, celebrating 50 years of existence, but these stats are all very nicely presented. So it's a, it's a source um, on which I was drawing heavily and which I can recommend uh, for further insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for another very, very interesting talk. Um, and I think we have all we have benefited from the comparison presented by all three speakers. Thanks to all of you. We have received a couple of questions, but I'm afraid that due to time, we will not be able uh, to um, ask these. Let me just ask one of the questions, and I would like to ask all of you to answer very, very briefly, because we're really running out of time. Uh, this one question is the obvious one. Does COVID-19 or will COVID-19 affect central banking in Hong Kong, mainland China and Singapore? And is there any precedence um, available in the historical development of that jurisdiction? Professor Hoffman, probably you can start. Yeah, it is, it is of course a very, very good question. And um, we, we don't know just yet what all the implications are gonna be, but uh, there will be implications, that's for sure. Because the specific situation that we're facing at the moment is that we see a recession coupled with inflationary tendencies, not just in the asset sector, which has experienced in high inflation in the past, but now even when it comes to consumer price in the index products, such as, for instance, in Singapore, one imports half of certain goods have become more expensive because there is a global shortage of certain goods. At the same time, of course, Singapore, like every other jurisdiction uh, or, or market in this world, is facing uh, economic cool downs. At the same time, fiscal policy needs to intervene very strongly to support sectors, ailing sectors of the economy, just again, as everybody, as everywhere else in the world. So what I said before, which is, it has always worked very well for the MAS, because it could pursue its objective, regardless of other measures, because Singapore with its high surplus, and very solid government budget could, um, by way of fiscal measures, um, uh, intervene in other instances. It is certainly still true, but in Singapore, just as well as everywhere else, it is not totally unlikely that we will see strained budgets and therefore a much more complex environment for the central bank to act. Thank you. Chita, briefly. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I might well, we will might well see a similar pattern uh, of development in mainland China, but uh, uh, let me just highlight there's um, uh, COVID-19 probably had a, another push uh, towards the use of the so-called touchless currency or digital currency uh, by the central bank uh, in the PRC. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chang, any? Um, I think um, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on um, central banks, I think in terms of monetary operations, you do see uh, it doesn't have an uh, immediate impact on the monetary uh, operations. It still uh, looks smooth. Um, um, everything is still still going um, smoothly, but I think um, the, the difference is that this time is more like a crisis in the real economy rather than financial crisis. So it's very different from what we saw before. Um, but then um, what we are seeing is that like everyone, including the central banks and also on the fiscal side as well, you're seeing very large scale easing. And definitely this, this is much needed because of the, uh, the, the very dire con conditions in the, in the real economy. But I think the challenge goes really more like down the road when um, the, the economy, because 
first thing is like you don't know how long this will last of course there, there is like this rolling out of vaccines uh but still there are a lot of uncertainties and there could still be some economic scarring longer term scarring to uh, uh because of covid so i think down the road is more of a challenge to policymakers as to um how how they are going to uh, sort of um uh, uh renew or continue with the supportive policies whereas on the other hand like on the one hand they won't want to um sort of create a, a policy cliff um, by um, uh, um, um, uh, taking away the, all these measures um, too, too, too quickly. But at the same time, they also have to think about like um, whether that would lead to, for example, um, increasing the indebtedness and, and all, all those other issues that could lead to um, um, problems or increasing financial uh, instability. I think that that's also a challenge to the central banks. Thank you very much. Um, again, apologies to those who have uh, chatted in questions. We need to stop here. Um, I wish to thank all three speakers again for very, very interesting and uh, enlightening talks. Um, I wish to thank all of you for joining. But before we close this session, I would like to announce uh, upcoming events uh, at CHK Law. First of all, the next Greater China Legal History Seminar will take place on the 19th of March, 2021, from work ancestors worship to the rise of global trust, the, a history of the use of the trust as a vehicle for wealth transfer in Singapore. And this talk will be delivered by Prof. Uh, Tang, Professor Tang Hang Wu from the School of Law, Singapore Management University. Then we have next, uh, uh, seminar in our property law seminar series, recovery of funds lost in email scams, true contractive trust, question mark, and the talk will be delivered by Professor Luzina Ho from Hong Kong U. And finally, we have a teaching and learning seminar um, on the 17th of March, 2021, I'm not going to talk about my own part in this seminar, but we have two very distinguished international legal education expert, expert Professor Paul Mahak and Professor Emily Zimmerman, who will be panelists and will give their views on the future of legal education in the world post COVID-19 and on uh, law teaching as such. With this, thank you again for joining. Many thanks to the speakers and uh, we hope to see you again at one of our Greater China Legal History seminars. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah.